Hello and welcome back to Guillotined 18th Century Chemist Theater. Today we are going to talk about the accomplishments of Robert A. Milliken and Ernest Rutherford. The former you probably have never heard of, but the latter you definitely have, or at least you've heard of his model of the atom, the planetary model. So again, today we're going to talk about the oil drop experiment, the gold foil experiment, and then the planetary model. Now, Millikan built off the work of J.J. Thompson, J.J. Thompson of plum pudding model fame. J.J. Thompson realized that atoms were divisible, that there was uh, electrons inside of them and a hazy positive charge, he decided. And uh, he realized there was a relationship between the charge and mass of an electron. But uh, like any equation with two unknowns, he, he needed to know one or the other to solve for the remaining one. And since he only knew the ratio of the relationship and not the value of either one, he could never solve for the mass nor the charge of an electron. Enter Robert Millikan. Now, what Robert Millikan did is he created the oil drop experiment. Very, very clever. And what he did is he stole a perfume atomizer, filled it full of oil, and sprayed it into a glorified pressure cooker. Um, inside that were plates, uh, one of which had a hole in it. And he would charge these electrical plates, and then every now and then an oil drop would, would fall through the hole in the plates. And then as an oil droplet fell through, he would charge those oil droplets with x-rays. And what those x-rays would do would knock off an electron or two electrons or three electrons. And then by manipulating the charge on the plates, he was able to figure out when he could get the electrons to float, hence equal charge, or even start moving back up. And he realized that, you know, depending on how many electrons he knocked off, it was always a ratio of a smaller charge, a certain number of coulombs, which again, we don't need to memorize in this class. Uh, but since he knew then the charge of an electron, he was able to plug it into J.J. Thompson's relationship and then figure out the mass of an electron. In 1909, again, 9.11 times 10 to the negative 28 grams. And that's just one of the really amazing things about science. I could put you in a laboratory, leave you there for a year, and say, listen, somebody did this a year ago, find the mass of an electron. And you'd be hard-pressed to do that, because again, you think about the limits of a modern balance. But by calculating the charge, and then, or by, I'm sorry, by measuring the charge and then back calculating the mass, Robert Millikan was able to come up with a very accurate measurement of the mass of an electron. Again, hats off to Robert Millikan. Again, must be the bow tie. So then along came Ernest Rutherford. Ernest Rutherford was a one-time student of J.J. Thompson who uh, was from New Zealand, potato farmer, if I remember correctly. And what he decided to do was he was going to test J.J. Thompson's model. And he was going to do an experiment to help verify the idea of the plum pudding model. And in the end, he would actually end up disproving the plum pudding model through his infamous gold foil experiment, one of the most famous experiments in early atomic history. And so what he did is he set up an alpha particle uh, emitter. And that's something, an alpha particle is a tiny charged nuclear particle, pretty much stripping the electrons out of a helium nucleus, essentially. And he fired these alpha particles at gold foil. Now, he figured these alpha particles, if the hazy charge uh, was a uh, positive charge, meaning if the positive charge was just diffused through the entire atom, he figured that the alpha particle should bust right through, fly right through it, where he would detect it on the other side. And in fact, if I remember correctly, the experiment was, was him sitting in a dark room, uh, letting his eyes adjust and looking for these alpha particles as they hit a fluorescent screen. And again, he figured that all these particles should bust right through. Uh, but what he found was, although most of them did pass through, uh, every now and then he found out that a couple of them were deflected. A very small amount of them were deflected. So we'll let these alpha particles shoot through this, and then we'll see what that means. So again, almost all of them passed straight through, exactly as he predicted. But again, every now and then, uh, some of them were deflected, some of them at extremely large angles. And this is a real tribute to the, to the scientific efforts of Ernest Rutherford. I mean, imagine doing an experiment where 99.99999% of it works out exactly how you predicted it would, matching the story that you had. But every now and then, you'd get something that doesn't make sense. Many of us would just sweep that logical data under the rug and say, hey, most of it worked. But Ernest Rutherford realized that data that didn't make sense was really the only important data. And so he was really shocked by the fact that some of these alpha particles were deflected. And in his own words, uh, he said it was similar to firing a howitzer at a piece of paper and having the shell fire back. So those of you who don't know what a howitzer is, it was a, a large artillery cannon at the time. 
And so what this realized, what Ernest Rutherford realized from this is that the plum pudding had to be wrong. It couldn't be a hazy positive charge at all. So sorry, figgy pudding, but you are no more. And so again, most of these alpha particles passed right through. But every now and then one was deflected. And so what Ernest for the Rutherford realized is that the positive charge couldn't be diffused. And the only thing that was going to deflect a dense positive charge was another dense positive charge. And so what Rutherford had discovered was the nucleus. He discovered that inside this thing was a dense core. And that dense core was what was causing these alpha particles to occasionally deflect. And so he ended up with the planetary model, where that there was a nuclear model in the middle, a nucleus in the middle, and the electrons were on the outside, rotating around it, orbiting around it, I should say. Now, when Rutherford did his calculations, uh, what he realized was that the nucleus had to be very small. And the only way to make sense is it was 10,000 times smaller than the radius of the atom. And so if you're looking, if you're a friend of analogies, or a fan of analogies, uh, imagine taking a marble and putting it on the 50-yard line of a football stadium. That's how small the nucleus was in the empty space of the atom. And again, this was a weird, weird thing that an atom went from this indivisible particle to this hazy positive charge with electrons floating in it to mainly empty space. Um, and so people at the time were really confused about this. And it would lead to eventually the uh, craziness that is modern atomic theory. But we'll get to all that modern atomic theory later. What we'll do at this point is we'll spend some time talking about the ramifications of this, protons, neutrons, electrons, isotopes, and ions. And then later in the year, uh, we'll get back to modern atomic theory and we'll see where we can go from the idea of a Rutherford's planetary model. So I hope you enjoyed this little uh, jaunt through the works of Robert Millikan and Ernest Rutherford. And I uh, hope you enjoyed it yourself and have a great day. Oh,